right, so we did have a uh, technical malfunction. So we ended that last part with her talking about my sister, who was recently diagnosed. Diagnosis was about um, uh, eight months ago. Um, I could be a little bit wrong, but I think it was about eight months ago. And uh, so we're going to let her carry on from there. All right. So I was talking about your sister being diagnosed because it goes along with the fact that they do know there's a slight genetic component, but again, much more likely to have a sibling because you were kind of living in the same bubble at that point in life and somehow it triggers something. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about treatments. I already discussed the prednisone, the high dose of steroid to suppress the flare up. Um, up until about 20 years ago, there were no preventative treatments for multiple sclerosis. Now we have the interferons as well as the glutamers. And what they are is they are all injectable medications, um, depending on what you and your doctor discuss and what you feel is the best route to take. Um, your injections could be nightly, they could be once a week, or anywhere in between. I get the feeling that John is putting his Copaxin injection in front of the camera right now for you to see. And John does that three nights a week, rotating to different soft tissue spots on his body to prevent um, scarring. And, you know, you don't want to constantly inject in the same spot because you will bruise. Um, the medications work in a few different ways, but basically they are all designed to slow the progression of the disease, to eliminate possibilities of more flare-ups or to at least create much larger gaps in between those exacerbations. So there have been quite a few advancements in the management of the disease. And again, the disease is not fatal. Uh, people just really, really think the worst on that one. It's not going to kill you. Some days you'll wish it did, really and truly, uh, as you have to keep making accommodations, making changes, the things that we define ourselves by, like, oh, well, I am a, and, you know, some titles never change, like, I'm a mom. Or, uh, you know, I'm a school teacher. You know, these are things that even after school teacher retires, they're still a school teacher. Well, you know, I'm an athlete. Kind of hard for people to believe that if you're sitting there in a wheelchair and haven't been able to run in, you know, decades. So it is very frustrating because every day it's a reminder that, you know, things are a little bit different than what you thought that they were going to be. Um, I want to go back and discuss again just how different MS is for every patient. Every day is different. There's not a standard routine. Um, if you've ever seen someone who has uh, a physical disability, like they're a paraplegic from being in a car accident, their days really are fairly similar. If they have a very busy day, you know, if they do something out of the ordinary, they work a little harder at the gym, just like for the rest of us, they may pay for it the next day or two, but they've grown accustomed to that. So while they have to make accommodations for it, it is a constant. It's not getting better, it's not getting worse, but it is predictable and they can have a routine. When you are dealing with a central nervous system disorder, specifically a progressive degenerative disease like multiple sclerosis, every day is going to be different. The disease is unpredictable in the sense of, you know, you can't schedule, oh, I'm due for a flare-up and there's nothing I can do about it, so oh, I'll just clear the day Sunday and be sick that day. It doesn't work that way. Uh, again, you know, some people can't handle heat. Some people can't handle cold. A lot of patients can tell you when the weather is changing and it could be pain. Like, you know, we've all had that grandma or that grandpa that has the arthritic knee and, oh, there's a snowstorm coming and they really do know that. Um, but you'll find that a lot of MS patients, when the barometric pressure drops for a storm to come in, 
they have heavier symptoms, if you will. If they have slurred speech, it'll be worse. If they are uh, one of the people who suffers with pain, their pain will be more intense. Their entire body is kind of on red alert for whatever reason. Um, weird symptoms can happen with MS. Like, uh, I, wish I mentioned loss of vision earlier. Because there are so many tiny little invisible wires, if you will, that can be affected. You, know, you just need that one wire to be tripped, like plucking the string on a guitar and the vibrations, how you can watch it go down. You see the whole thing. This tiny little spot affects everything along that pathway. Um, I know someone who lost color vision in one eye. Still had perfect vision, but it was black and white for years. And then suddenly it was back and it was fine. Because why? We don't know. Somehow that string got plucked, if you will. Um, you have people who have coordination issues that are very, very common. And then one day you look at them and you're going, oh my gosh, did they cure your disease? You're moving great today. They don't know why the the disease can do that it's not correcting itself but we do know that the body has fail safes you can retrain nerves to do something that they hadn't if you've ever seen someone go through physical therapy to recover after a surgery or a car accident we do know that the body can be taught to do things so maybe the body found a way around something and the idea with the treatments is to get the flare-ups to stay away so the body can retrain and there is some natural coping that will happen but every day is different there can be bladder and bowel issues there can be digestive issues there can be you know an eye that suddenly just wants to tear constantly or eyes that don't tear and so they have to use eye drops because the message isn't getting to the tear ducts anymore to keep the eyeballs wet the weirdest things can happen. The simplest things, the most heinous of things. It is constantly unpredictable. You can count on the unpredictability of the disease. So never assume that because you knew patient A and you saw their disease process, that patient B or C or D will be the same. They may have one or two or a hundred similar symptoms, but their disease experience will be unique to them. As individual as our fingerprints are, that's how individual the disease is. Uh, the biggest thing is ask if it looks like they're struggling, offer to help. If they say no and they're cranky, don't take it personal. They're just ticked that they can't do whatever it is they're trying to do smoothly and easily. You asking if they would like your help is not an insult. In fact, there's a big part of them that is grateful to know that there are people who care. They're just too cranky over the fact that someone saw they needed help to recognize it in that moment. So don't be afraid to ask if you hear that someone has MS, especially if they are open about it and they say, hey, I can't do this, I have MS. Please ask them if you have a question, ask them about their disease, offer assistance if you're willing to give it. If you're not, just say so, be like, wow, that really sucks, honestly. I'm not gonna be able to help you out with you know anything, but if you want someone to talk to, I'd love to visit with you. That really is the biggest thing. It is a very isolating illness in that people stay away because it is scary to see you know the star football player you know having to hold his fork like a two-year-old, or when you see someone who was <clears throat> excuse me. a professional dancer in a wheelchair and struggling to get from point A to point B. It's hard for us to accept, but just think how much they have to accept every day looking in the mirror and not seeing the same person that they're used to looking at. 
um, um, yeah. One thing that I'd like to I'd like to interject a little bit here is how MS is a very silent um, a silent disease. It's it's hard being someone like myself, and I'm I'm. You've had the experience with other people. I mean, do they experience the same thing that I have? With I look normal. I, I'm I'm big. I'm strong. I'm you know I can crush people. You know that kind of thing. But <laughs> yeah. But you know it's it is a silent disease, and so people don't understand it because it doesn't it doesn't hit them in the face. Oh, this person has something wrong with them. Correct. Like when you see a cancer patient who's going through chemotherapy, they're bald. Right. They're skinny and gray, and you're going, oh, they're doing chemo. There are yeah, the signs. The telltale the signs. Obvious no things. No, it's very true. Um, I think everybody's probably seen the Facebook posts where um, someone who has a disease like multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and they have handicap plates on their car. So they park in the handicap parking and they go into a store and they look healthy and people actually leave nasty notes on their windshields, you know, hate mail, if you will. Uh, how dare you take this spot? This is for someone who has a, a real handicapped or a handicap, sorry, or um, like there's one that's been circulating on Facebook where uh, the sign that they put on this woman's van was, did you forget your wheelchair? Because people assume that that's what your disease is. You know, you walk into a store, and I know that you particularly, <laughs> John loves the vegetable cooler at Costco. <laughs> the giant refrigerated room is his best friend. Um, you know, he walks into the store with me, and you know, he's very tall, broad shouldered, you know, straight back. He, he has a long stride. He, again, he's tall. He played basketball. He takes big steps and we go into the store. He's got a steady pace. It's brisk. You know, we're doing things, you know, not even getting a huge cart full of stuff and just walking through some place as big as Costco, John is exhausted. He is drenched in sweat. His body is overheated. You would think that he's trying to do a decathlon in the middle of the Sahara Desert. His body is saying, no, I can't do this. And so, again, he's like, need any vegetables? Let's go read the ingredients on carrots. And uh, it's because his body really has hit that breaking point. So I have gone into Costco with a healthy, strong, tall, confident man who's striding into the store. And when we leave, he is using the shopping cart as a walker. Shoulders are hunched. His feet are on fire. John has a lot of neuropathy, both feet. And, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> It hurts to see him hurting that much, and it, I guess it, it would be best described, he goes in looking 25, he comes out looking 60, you know, he is tired, he is drawn, he is in pain, he has soaked through his shirt with sweat, he has to sit down in the air conditioning, and I drive a big truck, a Yukon XL, so you know, he's climbing into a four-wheel drive truck, and this is a guy who looks like he could pick the truck up, but because we walked Costco and bought, you know, three or four small items, it, he is exhausted and has to sit in the air conditioning, cool off. He gets in and out of the car, like the process is causing him severe pain, and it probably is. And it, it really is that fast. And so, no, you, you can't look at someone and go, oh, they have MS, like you can with Down syndrome, like you can with an amputee, like you can with, you know, a cancer patient who's undergoing aggressive treatment. Um, it, it really is, I don't want to say invisible, but definitely 
it is easy to hide, which is why a lot of people have to be sick enough to go to the doctor. And we don't just go, oh, I had this one weird tingling in my arm. I'm going to go have an MRI. No, it's 10 years later when suddenly that arm doesn't function that you go and you get the MRI. And so you think of these people as, you know, healthy, energetic. That's the biggest thing is you, you think of people who are always busy going and doing and suddenly, like you said, they're calling it at six o'clock at night. They're like, okay, I'm done. Uh, I'm no longer a part of the public world. I'm going to go live in my bubble because I'm tired. I'm done. I need to go through my routine. I need to take my medication, you know, do my shot. I have to get ready. I have to cool off. I'm going to take a bath and that's going to just zap me at you know, whatever the routine is. Uh, on that too, I think also, John, um, a lot of people themselves are afraid to admit that they're as sick as they are. It's not just the denial of the disease. It's wrapping their own brain around the fact that, you know, tying their shoes was the most productive thing they were able to do in the morning. Or that, you know, driving a car to work is a simple task and you think, okay, when I'm 60, 70, maybe even 80 years old, the grandkids are going to have to hide the keys from me because my reaction time will be too slow and to suddenly be facing that at 40 years old or 50. The fact that you can no longer safely operate a vehicle because you're just too tired to move your foot from one pedal to the other in enough time to keep yourself safe or people on the road. Um, do you have any questions or any examples from your experience, John, that you would like to add to that? Well, there was, you know, when I had the flare-up, had the the uh, start of the treatment and everything. Um, do you remember the time when I was over at your house and we were playing Risk? And yes. And I was forcing myself to use my left arm because it mm -hmm. was almost gone. You know, yeah. and you know, I, there was there was a drive inside of me. I wasn't going to use my right arm to pick those things up. I was going to make my left arm work. You know, yes. and even though you, I was like <laughs> a toddler when they pick up Cheerios <laughs> on a a high chair tray. Yeah, John trying to pick up figures, and he's like, <laughs> well, <laughs> like Attila the Hun over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it was funny because, you know, I had your kids laughing at me and, you know, you were laughing at me and I was laughing at me. But, mm -hmm. you know, there there is a, a drive that came, you know, to try to get a little bit better, you know, because I wasn't going to let it beat me. Although there's days when it does, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's just, it was incredible. It was, you know, that's. I think you brought up a really good point there, though that we were finding the humor in it. I think a sense of humor is imperative to get through because if you take yourself too seriously for too long, you just wear yourself down twice as fast. No, it's true. You, you have to have a sense of humor and then you also have to enjoy the, the strange things that occurred. So, for your last yes. story, for your last story for this video, I want you to tell them about us going to the pool. And when we got in the, the jacuzzi, what happened when we got back in the pool? Do you remember the... Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tell, tell that one. And that's going to be your, so. your farewell. <laughs> so after you're done with that, say goodbye to the awesome people that are watching. <laughs> and we'll make more videos later. Okay. Well, so... Obviously, John and I spend a lot of time together. We're best friends. He has been there for me through thick and thin. And I hope that I've been the same. He says I have been. So I'm going to assume he's not lying. Uh, one of the things that John is going to be showing you through his blog is how he goes down to the um, club and he walks laps in the pool because 
exercising on land just hurts way too much now for him and the pool helps him stay cool we also just go because hey it's fun and it's something that we both enjoy whether i take all my kids i have a lot of them or uh if it was just us so john and i had taken a day and it but didn't have the kids with me i went to the pool and there is a large hot tub and and I'm the kind of person that if I don't look beet red like a lobster when I get out of a bathtub or a shower, you know, it's not hot enough. So I love the hot tub. John loves the veggie room at Costco. So he's a very good sport to go and sit in the hot tub. And let's face it, he needs to try and relax his muscles even if his thermostat is broken. So we went and I think he lasted that time probably three to four minutes definitely nothing more than five minutes in the hot tub and he's like okay we got to go cool off and what little crazy kid doesn't love to go get real hot in the hot tub and jump in the pool because it feels like ice so we get out of the hot tub and i know the pool is going to be cold because i've been in the hot tub and so we get back in the regular swimming pool and you know it's got the big lanes in it and stuff and I'm cold, of course, because I was in the hot tub. John says, it really just barely feels cool to me. I thought, you're kidding. And I don't hear very well, so I swam a little closer to him. There was heat radiating off of him. Like I could hold my hands in the water between us, and we were about three feet apart. And you could literally feel the heat coming off of him it was insane which then of course we start with the jokes as to why the water is warm in a certain spot in the pool <laughs> no that wasn't the case he was just way overheated but again sense of humor so there are weird things uh i have to share i knew an ms patient who woke up one day and couldn't get his eye to open and so he had to physically blink it throughout the day and then by lunchtime it was totally fine but just one day could not make his eye blink and we don't know why just that's what it did for the day so just the one time ever so it, it is a weird disease it is unique it is exhausting it's exhausting for caregivers it's exhausting for family and people really can't be prepared for this and it's not a fight with a win or lose it is a daily struggle to just be everything you can be that day and if you yourself have ms don't beat yourself up you know take care of yourself enjoy what you can do do it to its fullest and if its fullest is 10 minutes and you're done for the week you had your 10 minutes. You did something that you still can do. Uh, if you are a caregiver, get rest and invest in ibuprofen because you'll be tired. Uh, and, but know that you are the link to their former life, to what they used to be able to do. And don't give up on that. Never underestimate the blessing it is to be able to help someone find ways of taking care of themselves of feeling independent um, if you're just a friend or an acquaintance of someone with the disease ask questions ask what their unique experience is don't assume that it's the same don't assume that because you have MS that when your sibling is diagnosed, it will be the same. You know, John and Sally, yes, guy and girl, oldest and youngest in their family, but they are MS patients, which means they are going to be different. And they are. Their experiences, they're both exhausted. They both have really had to limit their activity levels. They've had to give up things that they love, John especially with basketball. But while they have that in common, that's kind of where the similarities end. They're tired. They're both very, very tired. And then after that, their days are very, very different. So 
don't be afraid to ask. I hope you enjoy John's videos. He is actually a very charismatic fellow. So I'm curious to see how the rest of these turn out. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you for asking me, John. And I'll talk to you again, probably. Bye. All right. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate it. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay, so there you've got some pretty good information on what MS is. And uh, she does a lot better job explaining it than I could ever do. And uh, so she's amazing. You know, she saw me through all of this and was the one who led the charge into helping me get the help I needed, the aid I needed, um, everything. I could not have done this by myself. I just absolutely could not have. And so it's it's good to have people by your side that know what they're doing. And um, So the big question you might be asking is, so why am I making this video? Why am I doing this? Um, it's more for me than for you. It's it's my way of of trying to cope with it. My way of trying to do something. Um, my life has been extremely limited now. I can't do the things I used to do. The things I used to love to do mostly, which was basketball and writing. Um, the basketball has been physically removed from me, and the writing, unfortunately. Um, with the flare-ups, it has done some kind of damage to my memory. And so a quick story about that. Um, so this has been going on for years beyond getting the diagnosis. Um, a while back, I had finished my English degree at Weber State and had gotten into the master's program. And when I got into the master's program, um, I got through the first set of classes, no problem. And then the next set of classes, I bombed miserably. And, you know, it was a shock to me. Um, you know, I couldn't figure it out. And so I talked to the teacher about it, and he just said, you know, maybe you are just too wound up, you know, too stressed about all this. He's like, why don't you just take a break from it for a couple semesters and then come back? And he's like, that's what I did when I got into the master's program, so maybe that'll help you. So I thought, okay, and I thought, well, I'll just go back and finish up some of my uh, my other classes in psychology, because I was really close to a psychology degree. And so I got into the psychology classes, started taking them, and then I was taking a class called Theories of Personality, which is all about um, the old psychologists from the old time, Freud and on, you know, um, and it was all their names. And one of the things that was taken from me is the ability to remember names. I can do it, but it takes a long time. When we get a new person up at the counter, it takes me a good two to three months to remember their name. Um, with my students, I just tell them all straight up. But the first day, I say, I will not remember your names. Your girls, you are Chuck. Guys, you are Chuck. And, you know, I try to remember a couple of them throughout the semester. But, you know, fortunately, I do remember faces perfectly, so there's not a problem there. Um, but just names, names escape me. So while I'm taking this class in psychology, it is all about the names of the theorists. And I took the first test, and I got about a 45% on it, which shocked me. I don't think I had ever done that bad on a test ever in school. Well, in college. We won't talk about high school. Um, but in college, you know, I graduated with 3.7, was in the master's program, and I, I, I had it going. I was, I was doing great. Um, and then the second test came around, and I ended up getting another 40-some percent. It's like 48 percent. And, you know, after the class was done, I felt it miserably, and the teacher came to me, because like, I've known him for a while, and he just said, is everything okay? You know, are you... You got problems going? Is something going on that's keeping you from, you know, studying? And I didn't know what to tell him. I just said, I don't know. I'm just going to retake the class. So I took the class again the next semester. Same thing happened. I could not remember the names. All the test questions were names. And I cannot remember names. Um, so the second time around, I did slightly better, like around 50%. And 
the teacher came to me afterwards and she said, you need to figure out what's going on with you. He said, take the class one more time and we'll combine all your best test scores, try to get you passed, and then you got to figure out what's going on. And so I took it a third time and finally passed the class with a C. And, uh, you know, that was really disheartening. That was scary. Um, I've never bombed classes like that before. And uh, so after that, that's when the big flare-up started happening, when I lost the use of limbs and such like that. So what I want to talk about now is um, how people reacted when I found out the news. Um, and there are good ways and bad ways to address people when they have problems like this. And I'm just telling you from my experience, um, this is just me. Um, I found that there were three types of people. And this is what the people that you've known the whole time turn into. There are the ones that get overly sympathetic and uh, that's frustrating. You know, because they go to the point of just complete overboard, sympathetic, sweet voice. Oh, I'm so sorry, blah, 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 blah. blah. And, you know, and, and while it's sincere, it doesn't help. It just doesn't help. Um, the worst thing you can do is just totally turn away from the person. Go dead silent. Um, even if you don't know what to say, it's better just to say, I don't know what to say. You know, love you, sorry. You know, it's better to say that than to turn away from someone and make them feel alone. Um, those are the worst two things you can do. The best thing you can do is just keep being there for that person. Just offer what you can. Don't offer what you're not willing to give. Because um, one thing that when you get in a position like mine where... You know, everything becomes a need, whether it's company, financial, emotional support. You, you seek out what you can get, and you take what you can get. And the needs are so high on every level that what people need to understand is they don't need to offer what they're not willing to give, because that just hurts. That just hurts people. And so when you tell a friend whatever you need, night or day, if you need me, call me, be willing to do that. And expect a phone call in the middle of the night. Expect them to ask for what you did offer. Um, one of the worst things you can do is tell somebody whatever you need, just ask me, and then not be there for them. That is the worst thing you can possibly do to someone. Okay. Um, so with that, after the, after the diagnosis and after everything that went on, um, there's a time of, it's the, you know, the steps. You know, you have your denial and all that stuff. And you kind of rapid cycle through those. And so some days I'm still in denial. Some days I'm full acceptance. Some days I'm angry. You know, some days... I blow my top. Some days I lose it. Some days I am so miserable and so sad that I literally lose it. And then some days, you know, I'm perfectly fine and I'm just ready to move forward. You know, I'm, I've, there's a level of acceptance that I do have and it varies day by day. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to wrap up this, this one here. Um, what I'll do is I'll make more videos as I go and just kind of give information on what I've been doing and how I've been coping and hopefully somewhere, you know, someone else is maybe watching this and can take a little bit of heart in this because one thing I've learned is it doesn't mean that life's over, it just means that life has changed and you may not like that change, I hate the change. You know, I hate the change that has happened. I hate what's been taken away from me. You know, but at the same time, I have to have this little reality check inside me that says, hey, this is my life, and I've got to move forward no matter what it is, despite what other people might say, despite what the world says. One of the, the biggest 
you know, frustrations for me is I'm still a big guy. I'm still intimidating. I'm still, I look strong. I don't look like there's anything wrong with me. And so people see that and they don't understand the trials and the pain and the frustration that goes along with it. And so, you know, the best thing that you can do for someone that might have issues such as this is just be supportive and don't discount anything they say because they're just speaking from the heart. You know, there are days when I am so frustrated and I will let loose. You know, I will scream and cry and get, get mad. And then there are days when I can smile and everything seems normal. So, so like I said, what I'll do is I will update this as I go. And when I have any type of information that I want to share with you, then I'll do that. So until then, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know and I'll get back with you. Okay, bye.